I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys about um, the diagnosis and management of metastatic ocular melanoma. So this is something that, to be quite honest, is not a, an easy topic to talk about. But my goal here is to present the data. I'm not going to dumb anything down because I think that you guys gave up a weekend to learn about ocular melanoma. I'm going to try and translate the scientific and medical speak into common terms that everyone understands. And hopefully at the other, at the end of this talk, I can uh, provide some evidence for reasons to be optimistic and hopeful about the future directions of ocular melanoma. Uh, well, welcome to welcome to Denver. Um, this time of year uh, can be either uh, sunny and 70 or snowing as it was this morning, uh, but uh, I appreciate you all coming out to uh, my home, my hometown. I'm a Colorado native and recently got back here from Vanderbilt after a decade. I have no disclosures. I will be talking about the off-label use of therapeutics, particularly in the context of clinical trials. So an outline for my talk, uh, I always think that it's helpful to just provide some definitions. A lot of what we do in medicine is jargon, um, and half the battle is just understanding what people are talking about and what all the letters and numbers mean. I'm going to talk briefly about imaging and biopsies. I realize that we have a dedicated talk about imaging tomorrow. <clears throat> I'm also briefly going to touch on liver-directed therapies. We have a separate talk about that tomorrow. I'm going to talk about systemic therapies and future directions. So what is metastasis? So we've heard a lot about the local therapies that ophthalmologists and ocular oncologists can do to treat the tumors that are discovered in the eye. Unfortunately, some of those tumor cells can leave that eye tumor and travel elsewhere in the body. And conventionally, the most common place that they show up is the liver for reasons that we don't entirely understand. Once a cancer has spread from the place that it started to somewhere else in the body, that's metastatic cancer. That's stage four cancer. Um, and I always try and be clear when I see patients just because there's a lot of terminology out there that gets thrown around to clarify and disambiguate various terms. So we've talked about where the tumors go when they metastasize. Conventionally, they go to the liver as the first place. They can also show up in the lungs and the brain. I'm sorry, not the brain, the bones. Um, they never really go to the brain. It, we'll talk a little bit more about the difference between ocular and skin melanoma in a minute here. And the question of how is really an outstanding question that we don't entirely understand. And why do some tumors show up in the liver after a couple months, but then why do some show up after a great number of years? There's biology and there's interactions that we just don't understand and that we can't explain. And hopefully, uh, after the talk from Dr. Patel, what can we do to try and shift those risks? Can we take patients who are at high risk of developing ocular, metastatic ocular disease uh, and shift them into a lower risk category? Are there things that we can do in that interval between when they're diagnosed and, and so forth to try and change, change their risk? So uh, we'll talk a, a little bit more about scans later, but we do try and monitor for d disease recurrence. Um, and as those of you who have had treatment for primary ocular melanoma, you probably get sick of going in for those scans. They're uncomfortable. Uh, MRIs, I don't know why they have to be in that narrow tube and the clanging and the noise and everything like that. It's no fun. Um, CAT scans are associated with radiation. There's risk with that. PET scans as well. Ultrasounds are easier to do, but not necessarily always the most definitive studies. So at the point at which the surveillance, the imaging surveillance system that you and your doctors have come up with, if there's something that's found there, if it's, an, if it's based on ultrasound, oftentimes before I jump to biopsy, I'll get a different type of imaging modality, like an MRI, just to confirm. Because it's not uncommon that with an ultrasound, there could be um, a strange shadow that looks like a tumor that's actually nothing. There's a little bit more variation in it. But at the point at which we think that there's a recurrence, really a biopsy to confirm that that is, in fact, a tumor is, is oftentimes necessary if it's feasible. And also that provides the ability to get some of the tissue out to potentially do genetic testing on it or other future studies. So what are the differences between ocular melanoma and skin melanoma? Obviously, they share a cell of origin in common, the melanocyte, a, a pigmented cell. Really, that's just about all they share in common. Genetically, they are very, very different. So in skin melanoma, there's a protein called BRAF that has a canonical mutation. About 40% of skin melanomas have a mutation in BRAF. 
which is great because now we've got drugs that target that. This was a big breakthrough back in 2008, 2009, really changed the field in, in melanoma. Unfortunately, we, virt we virtually never see that inocular melanoma. Skin melanoma has what's called a high mutational burden. So there's a lot of mutations, whether or not they actually do anything functionally in skin melanoma, but we see a high mutational burden in, in skin melanoma, not so much in uveal melanoma. That might play a role in terms of the effectiveness of immunotherapies. In skin melanoma, we occasionally see liver metastases. In ocular melanoma for metastatic disease, 90% of patients, if they're going to have metastatic disease, will develop uh, liver metastases. In skin melanoma, we very frequently will see brain metastases. In ocular melanoma, we virtually never see brain metastases. So it's very rare that we even actually scan the brain to discover that because it's just uncommon. And certainly it's uncommon in the setting of not finding things elsewhere. And then in ocular melanoma, we see commonly a GNAQ or GNA11 mutation, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later here. We rarely, although sometimes we'll see it in skin melanoma. All of these data points are suffice to demonstrate that, like was mentioned earlier, when your neighbor brings you the latest article about them curing melanoma or Jimmy Carter or some new breakthrough at, breakthrough at ASCO or AACR, it's almost always going to be skin melanoma. And that's kind of difficult to deal with because why can't we translate all of those advances that we've had in skin melanoma and other types of cancer into ocular melanoma? For all of the reasons up here, they're just different diseases. So <clears throat> one of the common modalities to treat patients with ocular melanoma if they develop metastatic disease in the liver is liver-directed therapies. And Dr. Eshelman will talk a little bit more about this tomorrow. Um, but in this context, uh, sometimes there's surgery that can be used, sometimes radioactive treatments that flow to the tumors, ablation or chemotherapy perfusion. And patients who have either liver-only disease or liver-predominant disease and um, in other circumstances can be excellent options for them. And I'll, I'll defer more conversation about that to, to tomorrow. I am a medical oncologist, so that means that I use medicines to treat cancer. So one of the benefits of using medicines to treat cancer is they circulate throughout the body and they treat cancer not only where we see it, but potentially where we can't see it. One of the difficulties that uh, it's hard to understand with scans, no matter what kind of scan you get, a PET scan, an MRI, a CAT scan, an ultrasound, there's a limit to the detection of that. So they can't really detect anything that's smaller than about a half a centimeter in size. But unfortunately, a half a centimeter in size tumor would potentially contain millions of cells. So when we scan patients um, and we say that, you know, we only see one tumor here, one tumor there, the question is in metastatic disease is oftentimes, well, why can't we just do surgery to cut it out? And the answer is that when we've tried to do that, in most patients, there's cancer elsewhere that we just can't see. But if we use medicines, they circulate throughout the body and would treat all of the cancer that we can find them. So we group systemic therapies kind of um, by how they act. So there's chemotherapy, and it used to be chemotherapy was the only thing that we ever had. Now there's immunotherapy. A lot of people have heard about using the immune system to fight cancer. There's targeted therapy, using drugs that inhibit particular proteins. And then I'll briefly touch on clinical trials as well. So what is chemotherapy? So Nowadays, when we say chemotherapy, usually we're talking about cytotoxic chemotherapy. So those are drugs that are designed to inhibit or kill dividing cells. So cancer cells are oftentimes dividing cells. They're growing, they're dividing, they're getting bigger and creating more of them. But unfortunately, so do other cells. Hair cells, cells that line the GI tract, cells in your bone marrow. So when we see side effects or off-target effects of chemotherapy, it's because they're not just going after the cancer cells, but they're also killing the other cells as well. So we have a very narrow window in which we're trying to kill cancer cells but not kill regular cells. And one of the additional challenges is that ocular melanoma and even skin melanoma are not particularly responsive to chemotherapy. As a point of historic fact, um, Dr. Farber first demonstrated chemotherapy back in the 40s um, after uh, making some observations about uh, soldiers who were exposed to uh, mustard gas. So Conventional chemotherapy is essentially medicalized chemical weapons, uh, not particularly reassuring there. 
Um, but when we talk about the, the history of chemotherapy and ocular melanoma, there have been many different regimens that we've tried, many combinations of different drugs. Carbazine is one of the more common sort of backbones, and it's oftentimes used as a comparator in a lot of clinical trials. Uh, it certainly has some of the most data to it. Um, <clears throat> they have underwhelming effectiveness, and that's why we're talking about, that's why there's more slides after this slide of my talk, because we're still looking for better options than carbazine. If we look at a review of multiple studies using chemotherapy, on average, it only took about two and a half months for the tumors to start growing again. So not a whole lot of time. And so for that reason, we nowadays use different approaches. And one of the things that's most promising here is immunotherapy. So your immune system, all of our immune systems, in addition to fighting bacteria and viruses, they also have the ability to destroy cancer cells. This, uh, like was said earlier, this probably happens more than we realize uh, because our immune systems will clear out a tumor before it ever gets any big enough to be detected, um, and we never know. Obviously, though, in order for a tumor to get big, it has to somehow evade the immune system. It gets around that detection. So what should have killed it and taken it out, it's figured out a way to get around that. Um, and so this was really... Uh, so this is the cover of Science in uh, 2013. This was the topic of cancer immunotherapy was the breakthrough of the year for science that year. It was the breakthrough of the year for like two years running at the American Society of Clinical Oncology. This has really revolutionized the treatment of a lot of other types of cancers. Um, it is something that we are still understanding exactly how that works. Um, because in some patients it works really well, in some patients it it doesn't seem to work. So what, what is immunotherapy? And more specifically, when we talk about checkpoint inhibitors, uh, what are they and how do they work? Um, so the checkpoint that we're talking about is this interaction between the immune system and a cell that it's thinking about killing. That there are checkpoints there to turn, on, turn that off so that the, your immune system doesn't kill normal healthy cells. People who have dysregulation of this system, they develop autoimmune diseases where for some reason their immune system thinks that some of its cells should be destroyed and taken out. So in the, con I apologize that the text is a little bit here, small here. So a T cell or a T lymphocyte is part of your immune system. And this is particularly the type of your immune system that will kill cancer cells. So as part of the interaction between the T cell and other parts of the immune system that sort of give it instructions on what to kill, there's a molecule called, there's a protein called CTLA-4. And so we've heard a little bit about ipilimumab. This is the inhibitor of this CTLA-4. So in doing so, you're sort of goosing this T cell to become more active. And the side effects that we talked about in the in ipilimumab is essentially the side effects of having an overactive immune system. So uh, the, ipilimumab was one of the first immunotherapies uh, that came onto the scene. Subsequently, we've had uh, newer immunotherapies that target different proteins. So this is the T lymphocyte again. This is the tumor cell here. There's an interaction between uh, PD-1, program death receptor 1, and PD-L1 or PD-L2, so program death receptor ligand 1. So you can think of this PD-L1 as like a don't kill me sign, that, your tum that this tumor cell is putting up a bunch of, you know, nothing to see here, move along, don't kill me, you know, let, let's get everything moving along here. That if we can inhibit this with drugs, then the T cell says, hey, you're not supposed to be here, let's go ahead and clear you out. So these drugs, the pembrolizumab, also known as Keytruda, and the volumab, also known as Obdivo, these are the most commonly used drugs that we see in melanoma and by spillover effect into ocular melanoma. So <clears throat> looking at um, some smaller studies that have looked at CTLA-4, and I apologize. Um, so like I said, I'm not going to dumb down the science, but I am going to try and translate it for you. If these little texts down here, those are the journal articles that if you want to go out and find them, you can. But So what we're looking here is what's called a Kaplan-Meier plot. So time is on the x-axis, proportional survival is on the y-axis. So when a clinical trial starts, everybody is alive. And then as time goes on, unfortunately, the treatment doesn't work and patients succumb to their disease. So. Um, you don't have a strong point of reference for what these studies will look like, but um, 
what we want to see is a line that stays up as close to 100 and doesn't drop down. These are not particularly efficacious uh, treatments for, for uveal melanoma, for ocular melanoma, in comparison to what we see in the skin melanoma population. However, um, as we have a very vivid example of, the reason that we use these drugs is for exceptional responders. There are some patients who, for reasons that we don't entirely understand, who get immune checkpoint inhibitors or get immunotherapies. And just like you can get a vaccine when you're a kid and it can still protect you against a particular disease for years afterwards, there's some patients that in getting immunotherapies, whatever, for whatever reason, their immune system is turned on to their cancer in such an extent that they develop a remission or a durable remission that holds their cancer in check for a very long time. And so there are case, oh, that really didn't show up. There are case reports of patients who get checkpoint inhibitors uh, or other immunotherapies that even though on a population basis the results are underwhelming, that on an individual basis there are people who respond exceptionally well to them and have really stable disease. And as has been alluded to already this morning, we need to figure out why that is. We need to figure out why there are some patients who get immunotherapies and do really well these exceptional responders as opposed to some who don't. So moving on to targeted therapy. So um, it's a little bit disconcerting that there's targeted therapy and that implies that everything else is untargeted therapy, but um, targeted therapy in the context of cancer is genetically informed treatment. So tumors are characterized by changes or mutations in their DNA that give rise to cells that grow too much or die not enough. And so these mutations in the DNA can leave a tumor cell susceptible to drugs designed to inhibit these mutations. So the poster child for this is a drug called Gleevec or Imatinib. So this is time in 2001. So this is really one of the first targeted therapies or at least drugs that was designed to target a drug. This was designed for a particular type of leukemia called chronic myelogenous leukemia. And why has this really sort of changed the landscape and why are we all excited about targeted drugs? Well, this is another Kaplan-Meier plot here. So this is CML with patients before the invention of imatinib, drops down here pretty quickly. This is CML after imatinib. So a lot more patients with, CM, with chronic myelogenous leukemia who are treated with this drug that's designed to inhibit this particular mutation do really well. And if you design your drug well enough, then it theoretically only inhibits that mutation and doesn't have these off-target effects. In skin melanoma, this is a waterfall, waterfall plot where essentially everything going down under the x-axis here is a tumor cell shrinking. So this is a combination of vemurafenib and cobimetinib. So if you remember that BRAF mutation that we talked about just a little bit ago, this is why everybody was excited about it because patients who have that BRAF mutation, if you treat them with drugs designed to inhibit that mutation, uh, they work particularly well. So you've actually already seen this next diagram here. It's busy, but this is our sort of, sort of our state of the um, science understanding of uveal melanoma, uveal melanoma here. And we've kind of already talked about some of the drawbacks of uh, uveal melanoma in the context of it not having a BRAF mutation and it having a low mutational burden. That could eventually prove to be one of the ways that we will be successful in combating it. By having a low mutational burden, it means that there are potentially fewer compensatory mechanisms here. So we're just gonna walk through a few of these proteins here and talk about why they're relevant to treatment of uveal melanoma. So up top here, this is outside the cell, up by the title, this is outside the cell. This double bumpy line here is sort of the cell wall. Inside the cell wall, you've got sort of the, everything that happens in the, uh, inside the cell and then this dashed line is down here in the nucleus. So starting at the cell wall, you get particular growth factors that will bind to receptors on the surface of the, of the cell. Inside the cell wall here, in uveal melanoma, just about everybody has either a GNAQ or GNA11 mutation. So these are signal transduction proteins. So these are proteins that sort of serve as the telephone wires between signals outside the cell to the nucleus where the information is stored to say grow, grow, grow. So these particular uh, proteins essentially are Coke and Pepsi. There might be some subtle differences there, but just about everybody has one or the other and they function in about the same way. So if they're mutated, they 
stimulate signaling through these other proteins. Here's BRAF that we've talked about. Here's MEK, which we'll talk about in just a second. And eventually, the signal makes it down to the, to the um, nucleus here to essentially turn on a growth program. So it's like activate your growth program in the cell. However, it's not as clean as this because there's all this crosstalk between these other parts of the cell that try and regulate this. It's a very delicate balance between growing just enough and not too much, and obviously that gets dysregulated in cancer and so forth. But <clears throat> one of the drugs that has proven effective in cutaneous melanoma are, are MEK inhibitors. So it makes sense that if you've got signaling up here through GNAQ or GN11 that's going through MEK, that inhibiting MEK might be a good target to try and drug because then you can shut down that signaling pathway. So there's a drug uh, called solimetinib that uh, if you guys have been around long enough probably remember uh, some of the initial promising data here. So solimetinib is a, is a MEK inhibitor that in a phase two study compared solimetinib to to carbazine chemotherapy, and again, a Kaplan-Meier plot here for progression-free survival. So this line stays higher more than this line does. So selametinib did appear to be effective, um, or at least more effective than chemotherapy. However, there was a large phase three study uh, that actually did not detect any difference between selametinib plus chemotherapy versus selametinib and placebo. And the reason why that didn't, I mean, there's, there's probably more than one reason why that didn't pan out, but it probably pertains to the fact that this is not the only protein up here. This is not the only gene up here. There's crosstalk across these pathways, and potentially just inhibiting one part of these signaling pathways does not appear to be the only thing that we need or the only thing that we can do to inhibit these proteins. So the areas of targeted therapies in ocular melanoma is something that's under rapid investigation. This is one of the, you know, outside of immunotherapies, this is probably one of the hottest areas. It's going to come down to how do we find the right drugs and the right patients and then the right combinations and the right doses that are tolerable to shut down these signaling pathways. And because uveal melanoma has a lower mutational burden, it has canonical pathway activation, in my personal opinion, it seems like a good potential treatment option for these types of cancers. Similar types of cancers who have these same sort of genetic uh, characteristics have been successfully targeted with targeted inhibitors. Um, don't necessarily take this uh, list of studies here as gospel. Uh, studies are always opening and closing. Uh, a discussion with a uh, medical provider or consultation with a uh, group such as MRF or the QRM Foundation will help steer patients towards open and enrolling clinical trials, but it's really something that is under rapid investigation. So we talk a lot about clinical trials, so I just want to um, briefly touch on what do we mean when we say clinical trials and what are the phases and why, why are there so many different types of clinical trials? So a phase one clinical trial, this is the, they go in order here and they're, uh, phase one usually comes first. So is this treatment safe? So this is a new drug or a drug combination that hasn't been tried before. So people enroll on these studies because uh, and the outcomes that are tracked are safety and tolerability. Sometimes uh, I'm going to take a very simplistic uh, view of this. There's people who are very intensive into clinical trialists and we could talk about expansion cohorts and so forth. I'm just going to give you it, it on, a, on, on a pretty basic level here. Phase two studies, is the treatment effective? So once you've kind of determined it's safe and uh, you've got a reasonable dose, so does it show a response in the disease? Um, sometimes these are in comparison to something else. Oftentimes they're just the drug itself. When you get into the phase three clinical trials, this is really where we're trying to figure out, okay, well, it seems to be, it seems to show a signal, it seems to do something, but how good is it? And can we compare it to something else to determine, is it better? Oftentimes, if a phase three study is positive, meaning that it does, it is shown to be effective, that's, the results of that are oftentimes used for application for FDA approval. Once something's approved by the FDA, then you can theoretically get it anywhere, as opposed to the drugs that are only available on a, on a clinical trial, you have to go where that study is open, where that clinical trial is open. 
And then uh, phase four clinical trial kind of is this the best? So you're comparing this to something else. Oftentimes it's a larger study population, longer timeline, sometimes quality of life outcomes and so forth. But I realize that we talk a lot about clinical trials and we throw around a lot, around a lot of jargon that honestly sometimes even confounds my medical students. Just having sort of an overview of what are we talking about and why are there different phases of clinical trials can sometimes be helpful. So future directions. I'm gonna, I, I am not endorsing or uh, necessarily saying that any one of these is going to be the next big thing in, in any way, but I just want to give people sort of my view of what's on the horizon and what's coming to the uh, treatment of metastatic ocular melanoma. So the first thing that I'll touch on is IMC GP100, which has already been sort of previewed there. Hepatic perfusion, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and then uh, combination targeted therapies here. So IMC GP100, conventionally known as the Immunocore drug, because Immunocore is the company that is putting it out there. So it's in a current phase two clinical trials for ocular melanoma. It functions as an immunotherapy, and there is some encouraging preliminary data demonstrating prolonged survival in it. So what is IMC GP100? So again, these are, this is our friend, the T lymphocyte. This is the cancer cell. So what IMC GP100 is essentially a protein that has two arms, and one arm grabs a hold of GP100, so the glycoprotein 100, and the other arm kind of hangs out and waves at these T lymphocytes and says, hey, come attack this cell here. So it's a bispecific antibody. It's got one arm that attaches to GP100 and one arm that theoretically attaches to a lymphocyte to bring those two together so that the T lymphocyte can do its job. The handle on the tumor cell is GP100. It's also present on skin melanocytes, which kind of runs us into some problems there because you get uh, a lot of reaction in the skin when patients get GP100. So they get a big skin reaction because this drug is essentially saying about skin melanocytes, oh, here, come attack the skin melanocytes too. And skin melanocytes, like, what did I ever do to you? And they're like, sorry, you've got GP100. This is what I do. Um, the handle on the attachment on the T cell is specific to this HLA A star 0201. So, Everybody's got different HLAs, just as everybody's got different hair color and skin color and so forth. But about 50% of the population has this A star 0201. And this drug is designed particularly to be effective or to have a particularly good handle on lymphocytes that have that HLA. So, sort of patients who um, would potentially be candidates for this trial, the first step is to determine do they have that HLA protein? Because if they don't, this drug is not going to be effective. So when we talk about safety and effectiveness, as I just mentioned, uh, the skin rash is really the, the, big, the big, most common problem. However, this is an immune therapy, and if we kind of overstimulate the immune therapy, that can lead to sort of the body thinking that it's got an overwhelming infection or overwhelming inflammatory response, and sometimes you get just this immune system on fire reaction that requires intensive care and very uh, careful management uh, to make sure that those patients stay safe. After a couple doses, we essentially deplete the GP100 expression in the skin and it seems to go a little better. Um, so in some preliminary data presented at ASCO this year demonstrated about 73% survival at one year compared to 35% for other published therapies. So promising. Moving on to percutaneous hepatic perfusion, conventionally called the DELCATH trial company. Um, so phase three clinical trial that's investigating high dose chemotherapy directed uh, directly into the liver and then essentially uh, cleaned, out of the, cleaned out of the circulatory system before it can go everywhere else in the body in comparison to uh, investigator's choice of other options. One of the big inclusion criteria here is that patients uh, really only can have hepatic disease. As you might imagine, if you're shooting chemotherapy just at the liver, that's not gonna touch disease that's in the lungs or the bones or something like that. Um, so looking at safety and effectiveness, so uh, again, a Kaplan-Meier over here looking at overall survival, um, you know, reasonably effective, more effective than other, uh, looks like more effective than other uh, liver-directed therapies. When we talk about adverse events, um, uh, so <clears throat> grade, grade three or four adverse events are sort of like serious adverse events versus sort of like everybody here. So um, we, on this study, some of the chemotherapy does kind of make it out into the system and it does cause some suppression of the hematologic system. Uh, you do get some patients with uh, cardiac complications. So there's strict screening on this clinical trial for patients uh, to, uh, 
make sure that their, their heart is healthy enough to go on it. Um, but in any case, this is a study that is open and enrolling in many sites around the country. Tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So this is another immunotherapy where uh, these T lymphocytes, some of them do recognize that the cancer shouldn't be there and go in and attack it. So the idea here is that you surgically remove one of those tumors that has the lymphocytes in it. Um, up here, sorry, it starts up here. So you surgically remove a tumor, you get the T lymphocytes out of the tumor, you sort of stimulate them to proliferate, then you expand them, this is all in a lab, and then you infuse them back into the patient. So it's like you cut out a tumor, you take out the, the, the fighting immune cells in there, you rev them up, and then you give them back into a patient, um, which sounds like science fiction, but it's something that we do. Um, and we do it because there's some preliminary data that looks like it's effective. So um, this is another waterfall plot that demonstrates growth, for, growth versus shrinkage of tumors. Um, and you get a reasonable number of patients who have shrinkage of their tumors. The challenge with this is that there's one step in there that before you give them back those expanded up lymphocytes, you give them chemotherapy to kind of knock out all of the other lymphocytes so that kind of your fighters are the only ones that are going to be in there to fight with. Uh, but that requires some pretty heavy doses of chemotherapy. So doing that gives you a lot of bone marrow suppression, which is what you want, but it's still it runs into problems because then you're at high risk for infection. If you wipe out your existing uh, immune system and the only thing that you give them back is an immune system designed to find a cancer, well, unfortunately, there's viruses and bacteria that uh, take that as an potentially take that as an opportunity to attack. So finally, um, novel or combination therapies. I don't... I can't tell you which one of these is going to be the winner, but there's active investigation in terms of combinations of MEK inhibition plus PI3 kinase inhibitors, mTOR inhibitors, all sorts of other proteins up there could potentially be paired with drugs that we believe to be effective. I appreciate every patient who agrees to enroll on a clinical trial because they do that in the context of not knowing if that particular clinical trial is actually going to be a benefit to them. I hope that it is, but what I do know is that if a patient decides to enroll on a clinical trial, that gets us more data, it gets us a better idea of what we're dealing with, and it will help patients down the road. So um, I appreciate everyone out coming out to Denver. This is the University of Colorado Medical Center, if you haven't been out there. So Scott Oliver lives, um, which one? This is your building here. This is the cancer pavilion here. My office is over here. This is the suite where Dwight Eisenhower recovered from a uh, heart attack uh, back when he was president. His in-laws lived out here in Colorado. He lived in the top. He uh, stayed. This is the old uh, Fitz, This is the old Army Hospital here. Um, but in any case, I hope you guys enjoy your uh, visit here in Colorado. And uh, I guess we'll take some questions.